Rob Puglisi. What's up, buddy? Good to see you. Good to be seen. I'm glad we're doing this. It's long overdue. Yeah, I'm going to stare in the camera the whole time. Is that professional? Um, I think it is. You have no <laughs> headphones. So you, that's a sign of someone who's confident in yeah, there. I just stare down the audience. Yeah. That's one thing about the Zoom pods that was actually cool because you got to frame them both side by side and they looked at the audience. Yeah. And, and at first people were like, that's weird. I'm going to Zoom. And now people are used to that. Mm. So I felt like when we went back to like the Charlie Rose style where it's like angled. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's harder to make clips from that. It is. Yeah, I get that. I just did one uh, a couple of days ago. And the camera was like right here and we were like looking around it at each other. Yeah. So whatever. I, I did one with DJ Demers where he did this cool thing I'd never seen. He took one camera. Mm -hmm. He framed us both in it widescreen. And then he used Premiere to slide between us. Like at, while you were shooting? No, like after in, in post. Oh, like, I didn't even know that was an option. Yeah, he'd be, he would be on me and then he'd slide it over. So it's just like a profile of you? Not like a... Like we're sitting on the couch kind of side by side, uh, but he framed it so that he can cut between us with one camera. I was like, this is... That's genius. It's so genius. That's I was, incredible. I was hella impressed. And it like looks good and stuff? Yeah. I mean, look at the clip on my Instagram. I won't, but... Uh, <laughs> no, and I'll like it. it. Yeah. Look and like. Uh, you know who does it well is... Um, you ever watch Tiger Belly, Bobby Lee's podcast? I have, yeah. They do... They have a bunch of cameras, though. They got a wide... And then they, or no, it's only three. They have a wide and then they have one of him and his girlfriend and then they have one of the guest. So it's three cameras and you just cut between. Yeah. That that's what we do here. Head. Yeah. So one, one. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually very easy. Like I thought it would be this huge thing. No, you just go hard. through and you're like one, two, three. Yeah. One, two, three. The hardest part is just labeling the clips right when you upload it so, so that you know which is which. You might automatically do it on some cameras. No, but there's only three and they're huge <laughs> long clips, right? Mm -hmm. And you see them. Camera one, two, three. Oh, right. And so you're just like one, two, three. And the audio is all one track, right? Audio, well, it's two tracks, one for me, one for you. And then you're good to go. Nice. Is that what people want to hear about? <laughs> well, we're getting warmed up. I like it. No, let's get into the technical aspect of podcasting. What do you got here? Zoom? Zoom. Zoom is classic. There you go. Yeah, Zoom H6. I just sold one to somebody else. Okay, okay. They uh, The first one broke, and then I was like, hey, can I get a warranty? And they're like, no, it's going to be $180. Ooh. And I was like, so I flexed on him a little bit. I said, hey, I have three of your items. If you make a scene, most people will acquiesce no matter yeah, what it I, is. I, I didn't make a scene. I politely said, hey, look, I promote your products well, a, a lot. that's a Canadian scene. Yeah, <laughs> a Canadian scene thing is being <laughs> overly polite. Scene. But shout outs to Zoom for hooking it up. There you go. Nice. Um, so yeah, they did that. Cool, cool. But what I wanted to talk to you about, which is very interesting, yeah, I find so you just recently sh uh, sold the show to Amazon uh, to a producer who put it on Amazon. Yes, and that's good that you said that because I wanted to talk about what selling a show is mm -hmm. for you in this situation because it means so many different things to different people. Yeah, yeah. So for you, you sold it to a producer. Yeah, we found a producer. We've been making sketches for a while, and uh, we've been doing it for no money <clears throat> for like five years. And then we decided to package it all as a, um, like we just had individual clips on, uh, you know, fucking whatever. And then we decided to package it all as an actual pilot. We found a guy who's just an independent producer who uh, liked our stuff and was like, I'll buy it from you guys. We'll get it on Amazon. We'll give you, you know, I'll pay you for each episode and then I'll give you money to make it. So that's like the big thing for us is that it's, it gives it a little legitimacy. And then also um, we have money to make the show. Because doing it for zero dollars sucks. So yeah, there's costs, there's time, there's you can pay people. It's nice. Yeah, it's just like not having to do all of it at once. Like we were literally the camera guy, the sound guy, and acting and directing and writing, and it's just exhausting. It's and too much. It's not fun. Like it wasn't fun. Now we get to just do the thing and have fun. So it existed on YouTube mm -hmm. before, and then uh, the producer saw it. Well, like the individual clips existed. Yeah. We made that into a pilot with like we shot an interstitial thing between the whole episode, and then we showed that to a producer guy, and uh, yeah, and he was like, "Yeah, man, I'm taking on like new stuff. I'm trying to do different things. So I like what you guys got. We'll uh, give you a little bit of money, and you know, we'll um, try to help you make more." Did you pull up down the original clips? No, that's what's cool. We were like, 
so the deal is he bought it from us. He's buying each individual episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then he gets the back end, like however the views are, whatever it is on Amazon. And uh, But he was like, you know, if this goes crazy and whatever happens, at any time you guys want, you can like pull out and it's cool. So he's a good dude. Oh, so you basically licensed it to him. I guess so. I don't know anything about anything. <laughs> but sure, sounds good. Yeah, well, if you get to, re- if the content returns to you. He owns it. Okay. So each one we sell, he owns. Yeah. But if it like, uh, we can use it for other shit too. So it's like, he has rights to it. But if we want to um, put it on different things, we can. I don't know. Dude, I don't know anything about it. I literally <laughs> just write dumb jokes. And then I have a guy, one of the guys luckily knows what the fuck he's talking about. And he yeah. does all of it. Well, that's the team dynamic. So one of you is the business guy in, in the three of you? Or do you have like a fourth it's all three of us, and one of us, one's the business dude, basically. Nice. Yeah. But it is interesting because, like, I've known you for a few years. Yeah. And I didn't even know you had this thing around that you were doing it. I would have never been on the podcast. No, you would have been on the podcast. I don't we think would, so, Latif. We would have talked about comedy. I don't but think so. It's a catalyst. It's a catalyst to have you on because I saw you at the night camp. Mm. You posted about the show. I'm like, this will be an interesting episode. Yeah, we've been doing it for a couple of years. We keep it low key. It's like stand up's the main thing I do, but uh, but why do you keep it low key? Well, we, I mean, I don't talk about it to other comics because I don't want to hear what other comics are like. That's boring. But other comics, other way you get opportunities. Like, what if another comics like, oh, this would be perfect for so and so. Let me hook you up. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we weren't like hiding it. We'd yeah, put it online, and I'd be like, hey, watch this shit. But nobody, unless you're making the um. You know, the TikTok style shit, nobody's going to watch it. You know, if it's longer than 30 seconds, people don't care, which is fine. I get it. And yeah. Some Unless are... it's on the Amazon box, because then you're already committed right. to over five and minutes. And then you get some legitimacy, too. Like, that's what matters. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can take other meetings being like, yeah, what'd you do? Oh, I just sold this show to Amazon. Mm-hmm. They're like, how do you want your coffee? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which no, is what helps. I did to you this morning. <laughs> you're like, I already have a monster. I'm Rock good. That monster, baby. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know, man. I don't like this city uh, sucks and I hate it in a lot of ways. It's, it's uh, the podcast about show business, right? Yeah. I hate it. I hate business. Why? I hate the business side of it because it's so scummy. All of it's so scummy. I would argue that it's the least scummy it's ever been. I feel like that's fine, but it's still the scummiest business in the world. That's true. I, that, that is fair. It doesn't say much. You know what I mean? Like, you can tell me why it's the least scummy it's ever been, but. Um, there's more transparency. Like if I need to get to Rob mm -hmm. and some middleman's middlemaning me, I can just DM you. So there's a lot of like elimination of like useless middlemen and middle people who would just like take a cut in between you getting to somebody. Sure. That's true. I guess what I mean is, um, in particular stand up in LA, like I just want to be good at stand up and I want to do stand up. I also like doing sketch, but people won't fuck with you. Um, you know what I'm talking about. Like the amount of people on shows that are not good at stand up, like just objectively, right? And they are on the shows because they have a lot of followers or they have a big fucking blah, blah, blah presence or whatever. I hate all that shit. So I just want to be good at that and not like have it be another thing, even though I know that's the way it goes. But I just like, I don't know, man. It's like some fucking dumb old school shit that I was. I don't know why I think that way. I don't like advertising. It feels gross. It does feel gross. Like, it took me so long to put myself on my own flyer. Yeah. And so, to the point where someone had to pull me aside and be like, what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. But then when people don't... I got a beef with you, actually. Can I bring up a beef? Uh, this is a pod, the new beef podcast. Bring it up. I'm gonna, this is a hard-hitting podcast. Yeah. Now. This is Charlie Rose. I did the, um, the bunker a couple years ago. You didn't put me on the Instagram page. People remember that stuff, Latif. It hurt my heart. I didn't put you on the flyer? Put me on the flyer, but then I was like, yo, I'm going to bring a guy. Can I shoot it? Because I needed a clip. And you're like, no, I got a guy. And then uh, we did the show. You didn't put me on the Instagram page after. I know this is stupid. Okay. But it matters. At least it did to me. And then I hit you up for the clip. I didn't get the clip. I didn't send it to you? No. So I was like, what the fuck's this guy's Latif's problem? I I will definitely send you the clip. Did you hit me up through the page profile? or I texted you. Dude, I'm so sorry. It's all right. And if you're not on the 
there was totally this is a good example of what, like sometimes we put more onus on like people's intention mm -hmm. than like I totally just forgot. Is that right? Yeah, a hundred percent just forgot. And there have been a few nights when there's no photographer. So nah, were, there, there. were there other people from that show posted mm -hmm. and just not you? Yeah. Well, you're going. First of all, you're going up. It doesn't Second matter. Second of all, I'm sending you the clip. And third of all, I just forgot. It's such a dumb little thing. But in this city, like we don't really know each other. We see each other in passing. We've never. This is the longest we've ever sat down and talked. True. You know what I mean? Yeah. But in this city, it's like that shit happens. And then the way I go is like, that's fucking weird. Why yeah. would you do that? It just seems like an intentional thing to... I felt like you were intentionally doing it. I was like, like preventing you from being on the page? Yeah. Like, because it was like, I have no credits. Or at the time, I didn't. You know, yeah, I still yeah. barely do. Which, But you did know, you get the photos from the show? No. No, I get nothing. Yeah. So I was like, fuck's Latif's problem. It was totally just... Look, I do a lot of everything on that show from like cooking the food to like getting the chairs to it. like... It was totally just, I forgot. I believe you. I believe you. But it's yeah. little things like that in the city where you're like, you never, and it's such a dumb thing. I would have never brought it up if we weren't doing a fucking, you yeah. know what I mean? No, I'm glad you brought it up. In passing, it's not. I've had friends like, I, you know, even <laughs> like, uh, you have friends that do things and you're like, why do they do that? Dude, but that's It happens to up. me all the time. And it's like. And I try, I make an active effort to be like, that person didn't mean it. Because otherwise you go crazy. Yeah. And I do that normally. Yeah. I try to, but I struggle but I'm glad you brought it up because obviously you thought about it and maybe oh, for it, two years. It's all I've thought about. Right. Day and night. <laughs> like two years <laughs> to this moment, but maybe it affected our relationship slightly. I don't know. We, we don't see each other that often, like you said, yeah. but like I never felt like there was any tension from it. Maybe no, it wasn't you felt like a, a hatred bit. thing at all or anything yeah. close to that. It was always just like a, the fuck? That's yeah. why, but a lot of that stuff happened. That's what I'm talking about. Like this part of the, and it is like the business side of it where people are trying to legitimize everything they do, right? You're mm -hmm. trying to make your show look good. You know, I get that for sure. So that's when my head was like, let me on the fucking show. I make the show yeah. look bad. And then you spiral because you're a self-conscious comic. Right. Um, but that's like what happens in this city a lot. And yeah. It's a lot of passive aggressive bullshit that you can't address because you seem crazy. Do you know what I'm saying? Like to bring that, it's a pretty minor thing, right? But when you're a comic trying to do anything, like you need all you can get. So any perceived slight is like, I hit some dude up when this was going on, when the show came out. And I was like, yo, man, I never do this. And I fucking hate it. I reached out to a couple of people. And uh, I was like, can you just, I have a story with my the thing that came out today. Can you just repost the story? I'd appreciate it. I did it to a couple of people and everybody was like, yeah, sure. I was like, all right, I fucking hate doing it. And then the one kid was like, oh, that's cool, man. And then just didn't do it. And yeah. I hate him now. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, I mean, I'll have people either on the show or on the podcast who won't share the clip or won't share the flyer. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I get it. You're promoting other stuff and maybe you're on tour and you, or you have a bigger show. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's like if you read into all those things, you'll go crazy. For sure. Yeah. It's uh, it's the only reason why that particular thing bothered me is because like you did post everybody else. So I was like, what the fuck is happening? Yeah. And at the time, it wasn't... I was also... uh not booking a lot of shit then mm. mainly because i was in the middle of like a crazy relationship and just dealing with that yeah yeah yeah. so it was but you've done this show a few times so you're not on the page at all no crazy i did it twice we did the uh because you tried to do the late night one yeah once we did that and then i did a regular one when uh remember mark norman was running late yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. that was the time but yeah i mean i would say it's uh of all the people hanging out at the show to be like you know, you should go up. That's a clear sign that I believe in you and think you're funny. Yeah, no, it wasn't. It, that's what was confusing. It was, uh, yeah. it was like, I mean, he's seen me do well a bunch, so mm -hmm. I don't see why that would be. It was just a thing that stuck with me. Yeah, and it does, because like, like, I've had people ask me, and I get it. It's like there's certain shows that if you do them, it's there's perceived uh, value. Yeah, and I'm lucky that 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 the comedy bunker became one of those shows to have a sh photo with you and the crown became a thing mm -hmm. and the way that like doing hot tub became a thing or right. like these other ones. So, well, that's what I mean. Like this whole city, the way you get booked is people think you're valuable, right? Yeah. Whether or not it's true, you'll get booked off of a fucking flyer and you don't even have to be funny half the time. And it's like, dude, I usually do okay yeah. on the show and I'm having a hard time getting booked. And it was just like, but now it's like, like there's an element I'll tell you, like from my perspective as 
a reluctant booker. You know, I like running shows, but it, the booking part is not fun, as we yeah, kind of talked about before this started. And, you know, like you do need a few people on the lineup that are draws, and Definitely. you need a few people who are, you can just be like, this person's funny, you're on, and that's what it is. Because mm -hmm. you need audience. Like, either Absolutely. the club has an audience, a built in audience, yeah. like the venue, or the comedian does. But sure. there is an audience that people need for this whole thing to happen. And right. someone has to provide it. And I totally get that part of it. It's more like, but you do, you're good like that. You'll put up people that have, you know, that have nothing. Yeah. At least no draw. But there are a lot of comics in this city who have been doing comedy not long. They start producing a show and then they put on just famous comedians. Yeah. Like only. And then feel, it like legitimizes you in some way because you're like kicking it with, you know fucking whoever but then yeah, don't yeah. put it it's like dude you that's just gonna fuck you in the long run you know what I'm yeah saying? everything's a balance like you have to walk it's a tight line to walk and like you'll look at i'll look at lineups week over week i'm like oh it slid too far this way or not enough this way in the same way that like i make an active effort to make sure it's a diverse lineup too and like sometimes by accident it'll be less diverse someone will cancel this is who's available sometimes it'll be more diverse sometimes it'll be more famous there's there's a ton of funny people in this city. Oh, fuck yeah. Like there's, there's so thousands. many, like the list of people who I want to put on these shows is so long. Yeah. And every time I look at that list, I'm like, oh, this person needs to do it. Oh, this person needs to do mm. it. And it's, it, it hurts to be like, well, there's only five slots. I get it. A lot of opportunities are based on your audience in comedy. What do you mean? Like if you have an audience, it's easier to get a special. Oh, like fans you're saying? Yeah, like if, if you already have fans yeah. and like a presence and you're already famous, it's easier to get special. Yeah, you gotta Where be before, famous before you're famous. You would get a right, you gotta be famous before you're famous, mm -hmm. exactly. That's a good is that yours? That's really good. Probably not. Um, what's yours now? And but before you'd get like a special or like a ten minute when you'd be like, Hey, we're building this person right. up into yeah, being doesn't famous. Happen anymore. There's way less development in all the arts yeah. because it's like, Well, why don't you just It's fucking lazy and then they still take ten percent. Or it's, 15%. It could be as lazy, but it's also, it's like, well, everyone has to be on these platforms. We, we've reached that point. Like, you, you can't just be like, I'm not on Instagram or For I'm sure. not doing those things. And so if you're not actively making headway on those platforms, whether that's a good thing or bad, you're perceived to be not a good risk. The thing is that, that I have a problem with it is, is that some people are really good at that and some people aren't. Like some of the best artists are not good self promoters. That's true. They never will be. Yeah. And they need somebody to do that shit for them. You know what I mean? Um, and there still are Pat, like uh, Emma Wilman and I, we talked about Daniel Simonson, who's like a hilarious seller comic in New York. Uh -huh. And you know, doesn't have the hugest following and that's not a knock against him at all. I think he's one of the funniest people doing comedy right now, but he's, do it feels like he's doing it the old way. Right. So the old way is still there on the margin on the margin for like sure. you could still go to a mic at a comedy club and get a spot from it and lead to more spots yeah. and lead to being passed but like how many of those pass are available now two, yeah it's super rare one or two a year per club mm -hmm. maybe right but it's like the industry is still there so that's what's it's good and bad because you get to make you can make good content on those things right TikTok, Instagram, whatever, and do funny shit. We try to. Yeah. And well, learn look at to enjoy that. Yeah. Maddie Blaustein. Yeah. A bunch of guys that we know have built their own thing. Yeah. Blau did it through comedy clips and the podcast. Yeah. And Maddie did it with his own Maddie Chimber, mm -hmm. who we talk about a lot in the pod. Like he basically created a following through doing funny things that are stand up adjacent. Totally. But it's like eventually, right? He's going to. It's, I just, I, I don't see the need for the managers and agents other than when you're like super big, but you're doing all of it. You know what I mean? Like Maddie can go and do shows now and headline them, but eventually somebody's going to want some of that. It's like, what the fuck did you do? Cause it yeah. used to be the manager would, you're the guy and they see you and they're like, oh, this guy's going to be somebody I'll fucking take him on and they'll help you build that shit. Mm -hmm. Well, there used to be more money in the lower rungs of it. Now there's no money in the lower rungs. What, Until, like clubs and stuff, are you saying? Or yeah, you, you could get someone on the road as a feature. You could get them. There was more things to That's get true. for a new talent in everything, music, acting. So you could take a risk on this person and it not 
be too much of a financial burden where now the risk is passed on to the artist. Like you figure it out. You, yeah. You book your own taste. I have an entire fan base. Now, can you represent me, yeah. please? But now, like, to take some of my let's money. walk your thing three years down the road, right? Yeah. In an ideal scenario, you've sold this one show, uh-huh. which means you're, you have some clout with that. You have the brand attached to you. You sell another show, right? Now you get famous for the show. Yeah. Then people find you as a stand-up, and now you tour off that. For sure. Totally. That's the way it goes, and I get that. I hate it. But that's the way it goes. So you would, in an ideal scenario, you wouldn't have done this show at all and just no. I like doing up? the show for sure. I love the show. It's fun to do. I enjoy doing it. I just i I think that in L. A. in particular, and I know this is part of the deal, but I th- in New York it's a little bit different. Where like they value jokes and they value how good you are at comedy. Like I'm sure people get booked for other reasons, but by and large, it's like does this guy kill or does this girl kill. And if not, like you're not on my show. Yeah. We're out here. It's much more like how many Instagram followers do they have. Well, the again, it tr- comes to audience. Like if you go, let's use the seller as an example. You go there to the seller and it's going to be great. And maybe a famous person will drop in, mm-hmm. but it's going to be good. Right. So yeah. who has the audience in that case? The club. Right. Right. But in some places where the club doesn't have the audience, it depends on the person booked to bring the audience. So it's really just two different business models. Yeah, totally. Totally. But it's uh, even to the down to like a dumb shit show in a park. Yeah. You know what I mean? At that point, which is what a lot of last year was. It's, it's a lot it's, of this year. A lot of this year. So yeah. It's that stuff where it's like. I like the show. The that politics I'll... of it. I, I hate. I hate the politics. I hate not being transparent with people. I struggle with not being entirely honest, Mm -hmm. you know, and I feel like all that stuff is in some way like involves being duplicitous and I can't do it. So I just fucking go like, I don't fucking care. (laughs) How do you mean duplicitous? I don't know. Like the networking part of it, the like, Hey, let me do this. I'll get you on that. And blah, 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 blah. I just want somebody to want me to do their show because I'm good at it. That's it. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you get, you get a lot of shows because you're good. Uh, lately, but there's many a year out here where that's not, wasn't fucking happening. Like I saw you, you were on comedy juice a lot. It's a mm-hmm. big show. You just did night camp, which was great. Yeah. No, lately it's been, been good, but it's, uh, you know, it took so fucking long for that to happen. And yeah. It's still not like, I'm not doing shows every night. I want to do shows. I would love to fucking do shows seven nights a week if I could. I know yeah. It's like that's, very difficult. That's the goal. There. And everyone's in this like <clears throat> stage time panic right Everybody now. Everybody is. And they, and LA is always that way because there's no stages. I mean, there's, Three comedy clubs, really, a fourth in Hermosa Beach. There's no stage time. There are other clubs. At least New York City has fucking 100 actual comedy clubs. You yeah. Know? There's no... It's hard no matter where you are because people are still moving here from New York at all different yeah, I don't varying mean that levels. It's like a, yeah, it's definitely not like the answer. and the, I'm sure there's a lot of fucking problems there. Mm-hmm. But that's just the one thing about L.A. that sometimes bothers me. And the... I'm not going to, I feel like I'm just bitching the whole no, time. No, no, this is good. <laughs> I don't know, man. I just like, it's not my vibe to use an LA term. Yeah, but you're adjusting and getting things done, so. Yeah, because after a while, you're just like, I wanted to do, we wanted to, we were doing the show anyway. I love comedy. Like, I fucking love comedy. I'm a capitalist boy at heart, but there's a lot of it I don't like. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, it gets weird. It's just, it's fucking, it used to be like there was, We've all embraced advertising so much. Do you remember like in the 90s when like David Cross and Janine Garofalo and them came out and they were like counterculture comedians and they like selling out was bad. Yeah. That's gone entirely. We're we're in a corporate culture. Like selling out is good. Selling out is what you do. We sell me undies and magic spoons. Like our goal as comedians right now is to be able to get a podcast yeah. Advert and get advertisers. There's some guys that don't do that and I respect that a lot. There's some podcasts that like refuse to do it. But refuse and, to do ads? Mm-hmm. Not a lot, but a couple. Yeah. I'm or it's a Patreon where it's like your fans are and supporting you. Patreon's dope though. That I agree with. Because it's just your fans and they're deciding we like you enough to give you money to hear more of you. That is dope. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's the democracy. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I think that that is what a lot of it should be. I'm not, you know, fucking, everybody's trying to make money. I get it. This, yeah. you know, who wants to wait tables when they're 40? I'm fucking my biggest fear in the world. But Of waiting tables? Yeah, when I'm 40, you know. I'm well, close I mean, to, baby. Do you <laughs> feel that like, uh, 
<coughs> You've made it Excuse now? Me. No, not at all. Do not you feel that people close. are coming up to you and you're like, oh my God, he made it? Um, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to not talk to them. No, I don't think so. Um, but it's all, you know, your fucking dumb image, right? Right. That that's this what the city is. It's all your dumb image. But I think also people, a lot of people see that shit and they're like, it doesn't fucking matter. But it's something. I don't yeah. think people... I think people that know me, what's cool is people that know me and are friends of mine and are com- comedians, I think genuinely are happy that I got something. There was a sense of like pride. Like I saw a lot of people reposting your yeah, thing and being like, and that like, felt nice. Rob is great. And I only Look had to beg thing. two of them. <laughs> yeah. It, you know, you only, but it felt nice. hundred bucks each is pretty good deal. It's cheap, but, man. Talk about advertising. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. So that stuff's cool, but I don't, you know, you already ordered your Bentley, obviously. Uh huh. It's in the mail. Apparently they mail them now. I don't. Um, yeah, it's like the water sponge. You just pour water on. Yeah, technology's nuts, man. Yeah. It's an Elon Musk thing. I don't. I hate adulation, dude. Even like, I like it when I'm on stage. Please be laughing. But then yeah. as soon as I get off, if somebody comes up and they're like, "I loved you," I'm like, "Oh no, <laughs> I'm too well with it." Are you good at that? I I hate it. I I say thank you. It, I mean, but it, does it make you feel like? Because my first reaction is like, ah, it wasn't whatever. Well, I think that's a natural, we know how well we did relative to our other right. times, which the people, if they've only seen us the one time, they don't know. Right. So we have that dialogue in our heads, but I just try to be nice. I'm like, thank, Me too, yeah. thank you. I'm not like a, I don't walk away, but yeah, yeah. there's some guys I, I think are good at it and are like, and that's a good skill to have. I like the guys who like leave and then wait for everyone to leave and talk to everybody. I'm like, that's just you might feel whatever way about it, but that's I'm like, that's what doing. you're supposed to do. Yeah. And I suck at it. Yeah. That's what like hand them a, even like handing them a sticker with your socials. It's like, it means a lot. Me and this kid were talking last night and it was like, dude, after every show you do, no matter how small and shitty, if somebody's laughing and they say they like you, get their email. Yeah. Or get them like, to follow you anything. or tell them about your next show. He was like, all you need is a hundred people, a hundred uh, or a thousand people, right? All you need is a thousand people to give you a hundred dollars a year and you'll make a hundred thousand a year. Obviously it's not that simple, but yeah. But like when you break it down, it's like, yeah, yeah, I guess that's, that's an, or 10,000 giving you 10. Right. And which is basically Patreon. Yeah, for sure. And then it's, you have a living and then you can support yourself from the art and you mm-hmm. can keep growing. Yeah. And I think that's personality shit. You know, I think some people are just better at people dealing with people in general and like are more affable in life than you know other people yeah and that's a good skill to have and to not like judge yourself for doing it like look at this guy to yourself giving out stickers or like trying to get likes like you just have to it's kind of like the same thing of like being too cool to like take a photo you have like your idol like your come yeah you you meet dave Chappelle or whoever your idol is i'm that guy and then you're like i'm not gonna take a photo with him i'm that guy but it's not because i'm too cool it's i'm afraid that he won't say yes or he'll just ignore me so it's more that, but, um, I think it's cause it's, I think standups particularly bad with it. Cause like if you're in a band, it's a bunch of people, but standup is so like innately honest, right? The whole idea is to get on stage and be as true to yourself as you can be. Then a second later to get off and be like, Hey, please follow my blah, blah, blah. I think that's at least for me, that's the disconnect. You know what I mean? It's weirder than if you were in a, a fucking whatever, a band or some shit. Yeah, it does. It does cross uh, a line where it's like, all right, the distance I had between you and the audience is no longer there. Yeah. And now I'm just a dude trying to like, even though I just spent 15, 20 minutes an hour getting you to laugh and like me, I'm doing it now again. Right. For like a business reason. Right. Yeah, it's weird. Which seems small. I guess that's why those uh, headliners have their road or their opener do all that stuff. Because then yeah. it's like. They're doing it. They're getting the emails. They're yeah, doing the those t-shirts. things. They're selling Bitch. the t-shirts. <laughs> and those things are happening. Uh-huh. But it, it is surprising. Like, in terms of like what... We all have an image that's out there, whether we're defining it actively or it's being defined for us. And like, I'm surprised based on like your image that uh, these things affect you so much, to be honest. Because like, you seem like a guy who... Like, you're tall, you're very confident. And like, so I'm, I'm kind of oh, surprised yeah, dude, that like... Oh, yeah, I do stand-up comedy. I'm a fucking mess. Yeah, but you seem like you're not a mess. Like, like your image That's is all part of the charade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I like even it. in your act, you seem like very well together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I'm not. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> nah, dude, I was. Uh... Yeah, but I think that's like uh, the how it works, right? Like, if I was as confident as I seemed on fucking stage in my life, I wouldn't be doing stand up. 
I'd Why? be a successful CEO or something. Because that's, at least for me, it's always been what, you know, that old fucking hacky shit about that where comedy comes from, right? Yeah. Self-deprecation and all that stuff. Would you be happy as a CEO? Uh, for a long time, I would think. I'm probably not, but, dude, my, my nightmare growing up was having my dad's life, right? He grew up, he's still in the hometown he grew up in. He had a wife at 24. He had kids. He worked at some job he kind of didn't like his whole life. That was my nightmare. I go home now, and my brother has the same life, and it looks lovely. He's got a fucking beautiful house. He pays less than I pay in rent for a two-bedroom. He's got two kids that are, like, the cutest fucking kids in the world. Uh, he does manual labor. He comes home, and he doesn't think about it. You know, he puts in his hours. He comes home, and he's done thinking about it. He makes good money doing it, and uh, his buddies are all around him all the time. Like, it's a beautiful life. I don't know if I could do it. Because I got that fucking crazy in me. You yeah, know, that you have the showbiz in you. Yeah, it's just like that need to like, ah, fucking yeah, yeah. whatever the fuck it is. But it looks nice now. As you get older, you're like, stability seems lovely. But a lot of comedians end up being married and having families I yeah. think for that reason. It's yeah, like sure. the stability factor and all of it. Both are doable, I think. Uh, but, you know, there's very few comics that make it, at least to a point where you can do that comfortably, right? Yeah, and especially like this is a a town that forces you to have a certain lifestyle or project a certain lifestyle. Yeah. That's some it's always beyond like just having what you need, which is sad. It's like we only need these certain amount of things, but like we're pushed to have yeah. the nicer this, this or capitalism baby. Well, if you're not growing, you're dying, which is right. part of like that's well, we part think of our growing trajectory. Means getting new stuff. And it doesn't. That's a good point, yeah. It has nothing to do with that. Right, like that saying is like a Buddhist saying, and they're not talking about getting a fucking BMW. No, but even uh, material possessions aside, like if your career your career is either growing or you're dying, you're either gaining followers or you're losing followers. Yeah, but I there's mean, there's no that's stasis. All, that's all. Like, if that is your truth, you're a miserable fucking person. If that's what you're basing your success off, you know what I mean? Yeah, but it's also like it's, that can't be your baseline. Of like how you're evaluating your life, it it is it's it mine, is. <laughs> it's all of ours. Yeah, but it shouldn't be, right? That's an innately uh, fucking insane metric that means nothing. That will drive you insane the same way all that other shit will. Yeah, like that's a good be... point because you have to have your internal happiness, yes. which exists right. outside of that. But, but that's but hard to do, man. It's hard to do, and also we're part of an environment that's specifically like capitalism, et cetera, designed not that way. Right. Yeah. So people are looking at you to post better numbers this year. They're looking at your streams of this album to be more than last album. Mm. They're looking at your Netflix special to do better. I mean, even like we have trade magazines that show the grosses, like the gross revenue of different movies. And they're like, yeah, this is it's what it was. Business. Yeah. But that's what, and the time is way past it's long gone, but it used to be there would be an antithesis to the system. Yeah. And that would be the popular thing, right? Yeah. Because people would be like, what the fuck is this? And it would gain its own cult following. And eventually the system would catch up and either give that person money or create their own person. And now we do the same thing, but it's all simulated, right? So it's like you're selling yourself as the counterculture guy, but it's like you're selling yourself. The counterculture rebel dude just fucking did it. Those don't exist anymore. There's very few. Because it's... And I get it. Like, I'm not saying that's the way it should be. But uh, it I is, think it was cooler then. It was cooler. It was more interesting it, it's, stuff. Honestly, it still is cool today, the people who, like, don't go that way. But name five, right? Major count. There's one. Stanhope. Who else? I don't know anybody. Who What? Just completely in every way, like turn their face on the uh, the projected system of stand up comedy. No, there's people who do it more specifically. Like Schultz kind of did it. Like I'm not going to be on Netflix. Okay, I'm on Netflix. Or like I don't care about late night. But he did it. So he by marketing, right? He did it through marketing himself on Instagram. It's fucking brilliant. I think he's funny. Yeah, but he he did it like counter culture. He did it his own way. Yeah, which is cool. And that's like. That's but that's as good as it gets now. You're that is, still selling yourself. That's exactly it. It's a hunt. That's a hundred percent true. It's that's as good as it gets. Mm -hmm. Carving blazing your own corporate path really impossible is, is the best. Oh right, best yeah, case yeah, yeah. scenario. You're like, 
you still have to align all those forces behind you. Yeah. But just to do it yourself and be like, I'm sticking to my guns and I don't give a fuck. That's so rare. And oh, I think it's like impossible now. Yeah. To not uh, engage in, you know, social media or whatever the fuck it is. Well, we've also been, we've been taught the truth behind the business now where it's like owning your stuff is important. Making sure you control the fan base is important. Understanding the algorithms is important. Understanding marketing is important. So now it's like, all right, it's not as sexy as like doing comedy and getting drunk after and, you know, all those things, but that's where the power lies. Yes. I just, the people that I know in stand up that are the funniest are the ones doing nothing. Because in my experience, not, and there's plenty, plenty, not saying that there aren't great comics doing good shit, obviously. I'm talking about like at my level where I'm at. Because it seems to be counterintuitive. Like those two things don't seem to exist innately in one person where they're hysterically originally funny and also great at promoting and great at networking and great at fucking, you know, the algorithms and shit. You can learn to do all that, but it's not, um, it's usually one or the other. You know what I mean? We have limits. Like every time I, uh, even with this new show at the nightcap, mm. it's eaten into my writing time. Right. And so like, that's a trade off that I'm not happy about. Yeah. Cause I feel like, so now that's one more thing on the marketing business side and one less thing I'm doing on the joke side. And it's tough, dude. It's tough because it's like, you got to do shows. You want people to see you out there producing it is fucking rough, but what's yeah is it the worth the trade-off in the long run to do because the long run is to be a comedian who people come to see right and sells out shows yeah and it's that's so fucking hard to do no matter what i don't know to trade off for it is yeah i mean there there does but also reach... you get more stage time because of that too yeah so that's a trade-off too but like am i i always go through this in my head like am i utilizing the stage time i am getting to the maximum and if i'm 100 percent true of myself i know i'm not if i know i'm doing about 80 percent of what i need to be doing on stage if you're booking the show and it's your show you should do whatever the fuck you want because who's gonna not book you again you know what i mean no no i just mean like am i offline before the show with my current responsibilities Am I giving myself enough time to write uh, to and be, be prepared moment, for that show? That kind of thing. Like, am I preparing enough for the stage time I do have? I get that. And I'm like, no, I'm not. <clears throat> I have that happen and I don't do anything else. <laughs> Saturday night, I, I, at the, uh, whatever that show was, I, um, dude, when I stepped on stage, I was like, I don't want to do this right now. <laughs> well, that's a normal, that, the, I literally got on stage and I was like, I want to yeah. go home. I'm tired. Have you ever had that happen where you're like, you get to a show early and you get the adrenaline going? And then you're there for an hour and a half before you get up. So you like go through the roller coaster of emotions. And by the time I stepped on stage, I was like, I don't know. Really do oh, yeah. All the time. I hate that. And then you sell yourself short and then you're mad at yourself after. I mean, but you can blame the audience, which is fun. That every time, works. even like on my own show, usually I get there. I'm like, yeah, producing it and you're hosting too. Like, I, that's I don't host nightmare. anymore. Thank you. You should. You're a good host. Oh, thanks. Yeah. You're fucking one of the few good hosts in L.A. Really, that's a very uh, difficult job to do well. And you and I think uh, Ken Gar are the only two. Oh, <laughs> me and Ken. I, I, you know what? It allowed me more time to focus on my set. And you get to do crowd work too, and you're good at crowd work, which is a rare skill in LA because oh, people don't do that. Yeah. You don't get the opportunity. I do it. That's my favorite part about doing stand up. I never do it. Because when I'm on a show, if somebody books me, I'm like, I have to kill and I have to do my 10 minutes at work. That's the hardest thing. Like the people who are doing the best are the ones and like rising through the ranks in LA are the ones who are like, all right, out of a 15 minute set, they're doing 10 of their killer and five of their new every time. Yeah. So it might feel they're always consistent and they're always yeah. doing well. Cause like, and it feels like you have to do that, but yeah, do you, I don't know. Cause but what's I think wrong you should with enjoy that? doing it too. Nothing, nothing at all. Yeah. But for me, I get like, I have, there's a couple of jokes in my act that are years old and mm -hmm. I fucking hate them. Same. And I keep doing them because they work. And every time I do them, I hate myself a little bit more. But if you were like, okay, you get past it tomorrow, magic fairy comes, passes you at all the clubs and says, Hey, you're past. You get a spot a night at all these clubs. What would you do? I think for the first 10 times, you got to kill. And I think after that, you can loosen up a little bit. Right. But then like of that loose, you're still 
like would you how much of that 15 minutes you're doing a night would that be new versus old um well i don't know uh i guess it depends on how much you're writing yeah for sure i just mean like being having fun up it's so everything's a showcase here it's all showcases like you can't even do a show in a park here without there being a comic in the crowd who books a show that you want to do you know what i mean so it's all like you're constantly it's a worse city to start comedy in and it's a hard city to grow in sometimes because you got to not give a fuck a little bit to grow as a comic you got to not give a fuck a lot of it to not grow as a comic you got to be willing to eat your ass like regularly to grow as a comedian and it's difficult to do that when you get booked on a show and it's a good show and people are there, it's like, and I get in my own head about it for sure. Yeah, we all do. Who yeah. are some of those? Na- do you mind naming names of the people who are like are so funny that are doing it the way you you like? You like the newer names in L.A. What do you mean, the guys that I was saying, talking about earlier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Rocha, Eric Rocha. Oh, so funny. Yeah, he's one of the best. I love him. Um, I think Spence Griffin is really funny, and he. Uh, He's got great jokes, but he's just like, he does fucked up material and people like get upset, but his jokes are great. Like if you actually listen to him, um, Sasha Boggs is probably one of the funniest girls I've ever met in my life. She's, um, she's just naturally so goddamn good at it and I hate her for it. And, uh, there are those people who are like, just so good. You're like, you have it. There is still an it factor. Yeah. Right. For sure. And when you see it, you're like, God damn it. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, none of those guys, like, they all struggle with the same shit. I, I don't think they would mind me saying that, that they struggle with the same shit I do. Of like, There's a lot of other guys that I'm not even thinking of. Right. It's not an exhaustive list if you yeah, but are not naming somebody. They struggle with the other part of it, which is the business part of it. Yeah. The not fun part of it. Right. And it's also like, there's a certain amount of serendipity. Like, you yeah, sold totally. your show this year versus three years ago. Why? A confluence of factors. Who knows? Oh. But like, now... There's a momentum that you have now that maybe you didn't have before. And it's hard to like, you can't manufacture that. Things just have to line up. Yeah, it'll probably last another mm, day and a half. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And then it'll be over. Let's last until Monday when this comes out at least. Yeah, right. I'm going to try to uh, milk it as much as it's worth for sure. Yeah. Um, And you're a sober guy? Yeah. Yes, sir. 10 years. I've tried to do it this year. I slept off three times. You're not a big guy. You're not a big party dude. I'm not, but You're I a felt man with a family. I felt so good not drinking. You have your own studio. You're not a party. It's guy. a desk with two mics, but yeah. No, it's a nice setup. Don't oh, tell thanks, man. Short. Yeah, but you don't drink a lot, right? Yeah, I did ask you. Uh, Maddie had us over and we're eating those pizzas, uh, was and good. and it's so. I mean, the guy just another skill the guy has. He He's can, such a weirdo. He's the only comedian I know that has other interests. <laughs> 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 like everyone I know, like it's all comics. They either just do comedy or do comedy and play video games. Matt is the only one that does comedy and has other interests that he's good at. Yeah. He's like a family man stuck in a single man's life. He's a, yeah, he's a dad. He's like, Hey, kids want some pizza. Yeah. I'm like, I'm learning dad stuff from him. I'm like, Oh, pizza oven. That's I'm, I'm doing that. Yeah. Um, but I was curious cause I was like, do you, if you had, you've been sober 10 years, that means you've never had one drink during that whole time. No, totally sober. Nothing. and then you're like, oh yeah, this wasn't the first time I tried. Yeah. And so you had attempt tries where you like you have a drink and then you have to reset. So people who are sober, they're always like, this is like the timeline. It's like if you have one drink, you have to reset the clock. Well, it's not that you make that decision. I think um, trying to explain being a drunk or an alcoholic or a drug addict to somebody who doesn't, because I don't think you struggle with that, right? You no. Don't have any addiction not like a. Di- I mean, I. I would find myself if I had one, I'd want to have two, but I I don't think I was in a position but where... you don't have 20. No. Right. I did every time. And 20? It wasn't, yeah, usually at least, but then also drugs. And it's it's like, uh, it's difficult to explain because it makes no sense as a normal person. Yeah. And it's still something I struggled with and struggled with getting sober, that there is this... It's like a genetic thing. There's some type of thing that happens like when I drink, my body is just like, we need to keep doing this until we can't. And you like have no control over that. So it's not like I have a drink and I'm like, oh, I got to start again. It's like I have a drink and my life is fucked for years because I can't stop drinking. Right. So it's not like you went out for dinner and you had a glass of wine. You're like, I shouldn't have done that. It's it no. Goes. Yeah. It's like I have a glass of wine. I could tonight go out and have a beer and then go home probably. But at some point within the next six months, I would get arrested <laughs> for something related to being because drunk. you'd that would trigger something to start it drinking. It opens again. the door. Yeah, it opens the door. It's a it's a fucked up thing. 
Yeah. It's so, weird. So you just keep the door closed and that's a, it's a better life. Yeah, it's not even an option, man. Like, I was where I grew up, we had nothing to look forward to at all. Like, there was in no Connecticut. Hope. Yeah. It's just dreary, dark, suburban. Well, it's weird because I just picture banking and boats. No, not the case. There's the shoreline. Connecticut's one of the richest states, and um, it has the three most dangerous cities in it. And because it's so gentrified, there's the shoreline. There's three Detroits in Connecticut? Yeah. Hartford, New Haven, and Bridgeport. Really? When they list the 10 worst cities in America, those three are always on there. Wow. Um, the gentrification is so bad. Like the shoreline is all people from New York who have billions of dollars and own all that shit. The rest of the state is middle to lower middle class. And in like 2003, Oxycontin came out, the drug Oxycontin, and just destroyed the whole Northeast, a lot of the country, but the Northeast in particular. And, uh, yeah, just like made crime way worse and all that shit. So we grew up in that and there was nothing, there's nothing, nobody does things. You know what I mean? Like an exciting life there was like, oh, his dad owns a restaurant. There was no fucking show business. It wasn't even an idea. The arts weren't something you talked about. There's no there, influencers there? Nothing. <laughs> and this, everybody goes to school for business. You yeah. Know what I mean, everybody goes to Central Connecticut State University for business or criminal justice. Those are the two things. Right. You're allowed to go to school for. Sell the Oxycontin or arrest people for yeah, using exactly. the Oxycontin. Yeah. And uh, so there's nothing to look forward to growing up. So we just drank and did drugs really early. And, Hockey? Uh, I was not into it, man. I but, wasn't a sports guy. I wasn't a sports guy. Surprise, you have the sports build. I know. I'm a real letdown in all ways. <laughs> <laughs> we skateboarded. That was our thing. So we were yeah, all Yeah, like yeah. Uh, that's why we get along. Yeah. yeah. I was a big skateboarder. We were all punk rock kids and we were the, we were just super nihilistic. I don't know why. I, I don't even like looking back at it. I don't know. We were all like suicidal for no reason. It was just. Do you think it's just the 90s? Like. Maybe. I think it was a lot of where we lived. Like there was nothing. It just seemed hopeless really did like there's what am i gonna i want to fucking i'm gonna graduate and then get a shitty job and marry some fucking idiot and have kids that i don't like that well, just seemed like the only option we were the first millennials like we're the oldest millennials yeah we had no internet i was alive before the internet right so we we're the first generation to be like well maybe every generation does this but our generation was like oh we don't want that yeah yeah and in many ways like all these hipster restaurants and stuff are a way of like making our ideal version of what we think life should be. Yeah. Cause dude, it turns out that even if you completely reject that, which is what me and my friends were trying to do, you still fall into a routine. Like, so the fear for me was the routine. Like you get up, you go to work, you come home, you hate your kids, you go to sleep and you do that for 40 years. And that seemed awful. So we started doing drugs and partying and like, you know, no routine here. Yeah. But yeah. it turns out you develop a routine. It's oh. just a much more, uh, torturous, destructive uh, yeah fucking illegal routine yeah yeah you gotta wake up steal stuff get drugs hate yourself and then keep doing that has there been any movies that have come out that have captured this side of connecticut of connecticut no but there was one um made about uh um cape cod which is not far from us was that the one with uh casey affleck oh, i never saw that this is a well it's not a movie i guess it's a documentary Okay. Um, so it's not like a narrative, but it was a documentary on HBO about Cape Cod and how it's literally just filled with heroin. It's just all heroin addicts. No fish. Um, yeah. That's a great, this is the story you need to tell the underbelly of That's what we've been trying to write for years. Really? Yeah. And it's hard to write because it's not funny. We want it to be a comedy. Uh, like the boring, the like depressing drug story has been told 10 million times. Right. right. Like basketball diaries. Great one. That was all true. Jim Carroll wrote that book, but that's been told a million times. We, because that wasn't, it wasn't just depressing. It was fucking awesome and fun. And we had a sense of humor the whole time. Like me and my buddy that I do the show with Richard Roy, I grew up with him and you know, we were miserable and suicidal and drinking and doing drugs, but we were always doing like always doing bits and joking. So we want to, you, we want to do both and it's, that's hard to fucking do. We, I, neither of us have the talent to write it. <laughs> you get Hopefully one day we'll figure it out, but it's not an easy code to crack. Yeah, because you have to walk that line of dark and funny. And yeah, and often like the darkest shit was the funniest shit. Like we knew a lot of people that died from drugs, and it would just we would make jokes about it. Yeah, well, you said it in the '90s, and you can be more free with your speech for sure. Yeah, it's it's, uh, and then you don't have to do text bubble scenes. I know. Bloop. I know. What was that? What was that movie? Bo Burnham made one. That was that. That was a modern day one. 
I didn't see it. Oh, really? It's really good. Um, I forgot what it's called. It's about a girl. She's like in high school and uh, it has all that. It has like text bubbles are a part of it, but it's it's very well done. Yeah. Not really about drugs or anything. But The first time I saw it was, uh, what's the one that Kevin Spacey was on? American Beauty? No, 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 no. The recent show on Netflix. It was like the first Netflix show. Oh, yeah. Uh, I know what you're talking about. House of Cards. House of Cards. They had yeah. the text thing. I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. that's great. Yeah, it's a cool. Cool way to do it. Because now, like, all so much narrative, like, you're like, okay, well, we have a phone now, so this wouldn't happen. Yeah, every TV show is a lie because not most real. If they were real, everybody should be on their phone for 90% of it, not talking. <laughs> That'd be fun. That's reality. Yeah. Um, well, dude, this has been great. I really appreciate you coming out. Yeah, thanks for having um, me. Dude. Can I wrap with a couple more questions? Please. I so got you, nothing to do for a long time. Hell yeah. So when, uh, did they have to, you sold them a bank of episodes. Did they pick through them or did you, uh, we sold one. We just sold the one. Yep. And we have a deal to continue selling them. We okay. only have one done. Got so it. So the guy was like, I'll buy this one. Keep making them. And, uh, we have enough done for this second episode, uh, as far as the sketches go, but we need to, um, shoot the interstitial stuff to make it an actual show. Okay. Yeah. And interstitial means like the stuff that ties it all together. Yeah. We try to do, um, have you seen, I think you should leave on Netflix. No. Oh, you should watch it. It's so good. Sketch comedy is hard to do. And, it's very hard to do. And I don't think we're great at it. Some of our sketches are good. Um, but we're getting better all the time. I like uh, the human game fighting one. That was oh, good. thanks. Yeah, yeah. That's a fun one. Um, but I think you should leave is Tim Robbins. who's the dude on Detroiters. He was a writer on SNL. Okay. And uh, he put a sketch show out two years ago, and it's one of the funniest fucking things ever. And it's so hard to do well, like a whole, because it's so, um, you know, disjointed to sit down and watch a whole hour sketch show is like almost impossible yeah. for most people. So we, ours isn't an hour, it's half an hour. So we try to do a narrative in between the sketches. You almost like, need like a more palatable. one time to watch, even with Portlandia, I didn't know it was a sketch show. I was like, oh, it's going to be a sitcom about Portland. Right. And then you watch it, you're like, Okay, this is a sketch show. Yeah. Let me turn it off and reprogram my brain. Yeah, it's a different thing. And then come back when sketch I now that I know what it's something else. Sit yeah. Down for. yeah. Um so that's what we're trying to do. Yeah, but, hey, a lot of the best comedians made it through sketch, became household names through yeah. sketch. That so. was the shit back in the day, man. I mean, I grew up with that. Sketch was my favorite before stand up. Yeah, I mean, uh, I grew up on Kids in the Hall. Kids in the Hall. Uh, one of the best shows ever. Yeah. It's so crazy cuz it's like such a Canadian thing. It is, but it's like, that's what I love about fucking comedy. It's universal, right? It's yeah. a lot of very specific Canadian shit, but it's goofy. So who cares? But I'm always shot like, because there's so much about Canada culture and things that aren't didn't come down here. Uh-huh. So like the ones that like you guys all know is always like shocking. Is there stuff that you know that we don't that's like great that you think people should know? Because I feel like anything that's awesome eventually ends up in America. Like Trailer Park Boys. Yeah, Trailer Park Boys. That was the next one I was going to say, yeah. yeah. Most of the really big stuff does bleed over. Um, But, you know, so much... There's just always little things that, like, don't. And so when you come here, every once in a while, like, uh, I tried to do a joke about a duo tang. I don't even know what that is. Exactly. Is it two tangs in one glass? No. (laughs) It's basically like a folder. It's a folder that holds stuff. And they call it a duo tang. Oh, cool. And it's a cool name. Yeah. And you're like, I said that and I was like, why didn't that work? I was like, <laughs> everyone got so weird at that point. Your duo like, oh, they don't know what it is. Vegemite bit that nobody gets. <laughs> people more people know Vegemite yeah, than Duo Tang. Um That's weird about Canada though, is more the stuff that makes it from Canada is the funniest shit ever. Do you know what I mean? Like it's Yeah, like Jim I mean, even the actors, Jim Carrey, Dan Aykroyd, Michael Mike Myers. Myers. Yeah. Like the funniest ever. Canada's yeah. weird like that. It produces, you guys have a, uh, you know, this uh, idea that you're just a bunch of nice people sitting around fucking talking about hockey or whatever. We're nice, but we're also, there's like a darkness to the nice. And then we have that English sense of humor in a way, the dry. Yeah. You get the sarcasm. And then also we're so close to America that we can look at it more objectively. Mm-hmm. That's what it feels like to me at least. But yeah. So like you can kind of see. The craziest thing here is it takes like a couple years to get adjusted to the news. Cause the I remember news, that from Bowling for Columbine. Did oh, you like, see it? yeah, yeah, because the they, movie? they, Mike, Mike, not Mike, Mike Myers. It was Mike Myers. No, uh, Mike. <laughs> so he, um, he goes to the Michael news. Moore. Michael Moore. Yeah. He does the two. Uh, he compares them and he's like, yeah. in Canada, we talk about like a bird at the park 
And here it's like, you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. So, but not even the fact that it was more violent, which it is. It's just like, you can see like the overarching narrative yeah. intent of the news mm -hmm. in a way that like, now I can't see it. Like I'm, I'm all the way in. Like in I, the Matrix, baby. I'm in the Matrix, yeah. exactly. But when I first, I was like, "What is happening?" That's a joke. You should write a joke about that. That's an interesting perspective because we don't. I don't pay attention to any of that shit, and I know I'm still affected by it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I Even mean, just being here, you're affected by it. Exactly. Yeah, I'm all the way in. I need a pill to get out. Yeah. Um, we usually wrap up with two closing questions, which is, what's one of the things you've invested in that really paid off for you? You're like, I'm going to spend my time developing this thing. It doesn't need to be monetary based. It can be time based. And this is like, it really was my thing. We're talking business or life? Business, life. Um, rejection, I think is the most important thing. If you're talking about this business. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. It's the most important part. And I think the only way to do that is as a stand-up comic is just keep doing stand-up. But, um, you can't hurt my feelings. It's really hard to hurt my feelings unless you like, don't put me on your Instagram page. I feel something. like I've hurt your feelings. With that. <laughs> Is that you let the see your Achilles heel? Yeah. <laughs> my, uh, fucking ego. Yeah. But like, you know, better to, check the nightcap tonight. I know. Right. I'm fucking furious, <laughs> but like to, uh, yeah, to not, I don't know to, uh, the way we grew up, we didn't have, you get picked on so much and we all picked on each other so much that it kind of deadened the um the fear of getting your feelings hurt yeah and i think not not being able to easily hurt my feelings is a very valuable thing i have well yeah you and maddie are both connecticut guys and you guys are both very quick at ripping on people yeah like super quick you guys could that's the it. way we grew yeah it was weird when i first moved here because i would try to like be friends with a guy. They'd be like, what's up, you fucking pussy? And they'd be like, what? <laughs> I was trying to be your friend. Right. It took years for me to like figure out that you can't just be mean to people right away because they get their feelings hurt. It's strange. Yeah, it takes, I think it's better in comedy, but even still, like you can't just do that right no. away. You no, have you got to gotta be buddies. You got to yeah. earn the right to do that. And I've gotten softer since I've gotten out here. Now it's like people do that sometimes to me. So some, if I don't know them and I'm like, that was mean. Yeah. But like back home, that's just the way you talk to each other. Right. It's the weather. It's like too a, bright out here. Uh, what's one thing, the opposite of that question, when you're like, you know, I invested in this one thing and it wasn't for me? Um, Like didn't work out or isn't a good thing to invest your time? It isn't necessarily that it didn't work out, but you're like, I discovered that this path is not my path. Trying to do jokes that I think people would like. There's a couple of years out here, at least in stand-up, um, where my shit wasn't working. I wasn't connecting with anybody. It might have just been I was at terrible fucking crappy mics and bad shows. Uh, but there was a period where I was like, all right, I'm just going to write jokes that aren't like edgy or aren't don't say anything and don't have any, you know, people can't get mad at. And I was able to do it. And I had like a decent set and I uh, hated it. And it um, and then when you bomb with that shit, you really hate yourself. Yeah, because you're not being authentic. I mean, not even that you're not being authentic, but you're trying to like pander the crowd You're people pleasing You're people pleasing oh yeah. which is the worst feeling yeah mm -hmm. yeah so don't do that <laughs> yeah but it wasn't even like people pleasing to the crowd it was like i want to write jokes that these comics like you know and then i came to the conclusion that like well fuck them who cares like i'm not gonna if they don't like my shit they don't like my shit yeah who cares but You're gonna... that's hard to really live that totally you're gonna be have a better career if like people either like you or don't like you like clearly yeah then if you're trying to please everybody yeah yeah you got to pick a side and yeah it's, but it's hard because you want as a comedian people and you know it's like people that i find and think are really funny like like i was talking about earlier like kind of the uh more like alternative comics yeah that i'd meet and be like this dude's fucking funny like i like this guy and then i do my shit and i it didn't wasn't reciprocated and it would bother me because I was like, well, that guy's funny. Like, maybe I'm fucking doing some shit wrong. And you get in that whole headspace, whatever. That's all I think about, pretty much. <laughs> there was a, um, we talked earlier when you were like, oh, sometimes we have to, in LA, do our best material because mm -hmm. you don't know who's in the audience. Yeah. I feel that pressure when I'm doing a show for the first time with a comic I really like. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, well, now I have to do, yeah. I got to bring it. Yeah, for sure. Because I'm either going on near them or they're going to watch me. And I'm like, okay, I got to. You want their respect, but the trick is, and you know who's great about this is Blaustein, is uh, they don't care and it doesn't matter. 
because they will not be the one that's buying a ticket to your show. So figure out how you're funny and just do that to its fucking core. And it's hard to do. It's hard it to is, fucking yeah. stay that's in that lane only. That's why he's doing so well is that he's doing him first. Yeah, I've, I, dude, I respect Mike so much in a lot of ways. Uh, he's a hustler he's, uh, since I've known him. And we would do we would do mics and he would, uh, uh, he's often, you know, he kills all the time. But he would sometimes bomb but stay in the bit and do it full energy, full bomb. Yeah. And then get off stage. Big kicks. Because he's promoting yeah, huge kicks. Because he's... Uh, He's going to then do that in front of a crowd of people that are paying to see him and kill. Yeah. But, you know, it's it's tough to do that if you're only doing mics because it's all your uh, or only doing shows in town and not getting on the road because you're like, this is all I got. You know? Right. So, I, yeah. And if you're bombing at that, then you have nothing. You, you're just bombing. It's yeah. <laughs> you're just doing bad. So it's it's tough. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, you got to have both, man. And uh, yeah, he's one of those dudes that I respect for that. He was like. I was like, dude, what if I, I was like, the respect of comedians matters to me. He's like, I don't give a fuck about that. I was like, well, you must a little bit. He's like, I mean, sure, a little bit, but you can't care about like, fuck, who cares? Yeah. They're yeah. not going to buy the tickets. They're not the crowd. You got to figure out how you're funny, which takes a long time to begin with. And then when you figure that out, which takes fucking a decade, like how I'm funny, then you got to start mining that, which takes another however long. And that's what people come to see. It's, when you have an, a unique um, perspective and a unique voice that's not yeah, everybody else. more of yourself. Yeah, and it's hard to do because you get in your own head about it and yada, yada, yada. So, Well, this has been great, Rob. I really appreciate you have. I really appreciate you coming on here. Yeah, what I'm going to do is open up the Comedy Bunker Instagram. No, I just, don't give a I'm going to post, like, it's going to be the week of Rob. <laughs> it's going to be Monday, Rob. You do one of those things where it's, like, five panels of just my face. <laughs> five pa- Oh, yeah, it's just, like, it's the... That's actually exactly what I'm going to do. Please don't. And then um, where do we find you on Instagram? At Rob Pug Comic. Um, I got a podcast called the No Charisma Podcast. And then please watch the show on Amazon called The Red Rob Roy Show. You got to have the in there for whatever fucking reason. The Red Rob Roy Show. Yeah. Also, does it take stars on Amazon? Yeah, I think there's stars. Yeah, give it five stars. Rate his podcast. Anything you can do would be great. Because, like him, uh, subscribe we're, we're him. We're out here trying. You know? We're out here trying. Yeah. And uh, I appreciate you. Thanks, Thanks for, for coming. Thanks for having me, dude. Yeah, it was great. And we'll see you next time. All right. Later, buddy.